It seems to many that Tibetans, like other politically unrepresented nations and peoples controlled by not quite post-colonial imperialist nation states, will inevitably be assimilated into the multi-hundredfold larger Chinese so-called Han population, 6 million into 1.3 billion, and, their Buddha, and the Tibetan Buddhified culture extinguished dissolved into the pseudo-communist, capitalist, materialist culture of red, still red China. However, it also cannot be denied that Tibet's top product, the Dalai Lama himself, also seems to have achieved in exile a remarkable success worldwide, as well as in the hearts and minds of his people, beleaguered on their home plateau. Though the Dalai Lama is scrupulous about his principles of not engaging in a Buddhist missionary project in a modern, totally interconnected and necessarily religiously pluralistic world, the many ethical, psychological and mind-scientific Buddhological services offered by individual Lama teachers as emerging from the Tibetan culture have spawned thousands of, quote, Dharma centers, unquote, all over the free world. These services also enjoy a huge popularity in mainland China itself, where there are still hundreds of millions of semi-resuscitated Chinese Buddhists who have learned a lot of new things from Tibetan Buddhist teachers who have hordes of students from among the post-communist middle-class Chinese who have begun to realize in their industrially polluted environment that material progress alone is not enough to make life really worthwhile. This makes a big point we saw before that People become interested in the Buddhistic sciences and the mind development educations when they are wealthy, actually, not based on poverty, but based on wealth. Because only when you have some wealth do you realize that that wealth alone does not make you happy and you have to do something internally and you have time to do it. So, in fact, the old stereotype that Buddhism is some poor people who can't make any better so they get into suffering, it's completely wrong. It, it, it's the kind of thing that appeals to people who are already wealthy and still miserable, among whom we number, we have a great number of people here in our country, so in the modern world in general. So in concluding the course, we might take a last look, a long look, at the life of the great 14th Dalai Lama as the top export of the Indo-Tibetan mainstream cultural tradition, educational establishment, and, indust and inner industrial focus. His own life trajectory, indeed, is the proof of the pudding of this sort of civilizational matrix, so to speak. I don't focus on him just because I'm a friend and I like him, but because he shows what this culture is capable of in various ways, which is very worthwhile, therefore, to focus on him in this final uh, session. Of course, modern people with the scientific materialist education definitely are not going to believe that he is the reincarnation of a celestial bodhisattva, messiah, god, who does it all effortlessly, beaming down from heaven, a ready-made saint and sage. In fact, the Western media occasionally using the expression about the Dalai Lama, God King of Tibet, is really a kind of tongue-in-cheek sort of expression as far as modern materialists go. We have to be aware of that. He was born, and let's look at his actual life. He was born the son of a relatively well-to-do peasant family. Father was known for his horse sense and short temper mother for her generosity and kindness, and uncle and much older old elder brother were known for their spiritual and religious achievements, both of them being recognized as reincarnations. He was recognized himself as a qualified reincarnation within the Tibetan belief system, within, with, with indubitable sort of physical proofs, recognition of objects belonging to his former life, recognition of people he'd encountered in his former life who were disguised as other kinds of people, giving false names, and he saw through that as a child of three years of age. And so it was very convincing recognition. And he was raised apart from his family in monasteries from a young age, while, while elevated on a throne like a wooden statue with people bowing to him from the age of five, uh, an, uh, an early upbringing that should have horrified any psychotherapist as far as what it would bode for his future. And he was educated in the traditional curriculum of rigorous logic, contemplative phenomenology, 
metaphysical exploration of the nature of reality, and a, a, a granted an antiquated cosmology, a terra-centric cosmology, but a sophisticated biology with ethical implications, the karma theory, and a scientific version of rigorous ethical self-discipline. This education was conducted in the midst of a very turbulent time from the age of 12, and at 15 he was obliged to assume political responsibility for his entire nation of six million souls, spread out over a far-flung high plateau of almost a million square miles, larger than the land surface of Western Europe or the U.S. west of the Mississippi. Then he spent eight years trying to harmonize with Mao after the Chinese invasion and, his, and Mao's dogged military invasion and liberating quote-unquote communist revolution, eventually being forced to flee for his life with 100,000 of his people to another physically poor country nearby, India, with different climate, different language, different culture. Throughout all this, he kept up the higher levels of the traditional education and maintained his pure code of monastic ethics, vows of nonviolence, vows of celibacy, vows of personal poverty, honesty, and sobriety, along with hundreds of minor behavioral disciplines. He then spent 20 years, from 60 to 80 approximately, establishing a model refugee community in India and Nepal and Switzerland and Canada, completely cut off from the people in his own people in Tibet who were closed off from the world themselves while the communists tried in vain to transform them from being Tibetan spiritual people into being Chinese communists, from mostly from being spiritual as Buddhists to being Marxist materialists, from being self-determined in their own vast land to being ruled as slaves of commissars and occupying soldiers.